We usually start each thing pretty much the same way, actually. So it's okay, tell, tell us who you are and where you are in the world. But you're in Nottingham today. But where, more importantly, where are you? Where have you come from? Where are you going to, Steve? My name is Stephen Mays. I'm a Scot, a recently acquired Irish citizenship, born of a German mother and living in New York. So I'm not quite sure where I am, but it covers the ground. And I uh, found my way into photography completely accidentally by going into a darkroom and I watched the, a print emerging from the developer from this sheet of white paper. And that was it. I was lost. Okay, so you're based in New York. I'm thinking that when I f first met you, Stephen, and, I, and for, for some years, you were, you were a name in an, an address book. Steve Mays, it was. I can see it written down now in, in the address book of, of Steve Pike, and it said Steve Mays Network. So what would that have meant? So Network was an agency of photographers. It was owned by photographers, and it was actually an agency set up in response to Margaret Thatcher and her political shenanigans at the time. And so the agency was very much focused on society, social doings, documentary photography, political photography, and, and uh, a certain amount of conflict and uh, stuff like that. Um, and is really where I learned very much about ethics as well as the just mechanics of photography and agenting. And from then, wandered through different areas of photography, worked in fashion, I've worked in commercial. The art world was maybe the most entertaining area to work in. It's a the art world is a phenomenally intricate and ridiculous marketplace to work in. But of course, you're dealing with some of the very finest people, expressive personalities and communicators. It's very really intriguing. Curiously, in advertising, I found uh, the world to be somewhat more ethical than the art world, I have to say. The, the artists, I have to say, generally were very well behaved. But the agents, if you ever get into the world and deal with agents, count your fingers after every meeting. Yeah, so you've just skipped over about a million jobs, and each one of those want to go into the ins and outs of. But you started out, what, went to school, right? Did you go to university after? I went to school, I went to university, I studied psychology, I realised very quickly I wasn't going to be a psychologist or do much of my academic training, and developed this passion for photography out of completely nowhere. It really was, I had no history of it, nothing in the family, but I became very intrigued by this notion of capturing life on a receptive surface. And I've spent the last sort of several decades uh, deconstructing that, that, the apparent simplicity of this process, starting with being a photographer. That really set my heart on, on being a photographer. And I, I worked as a press photographer in the United Kingdom, covering whatever was happening. I had a particular patch I was down in the south of England and working for all the newspapers as a freelancer and realized very quickly that there was no job for a gentleman. But it taught me so much about how imagery works and how imagery is used to communicate and miscommunicate, how facts and truth are very separate entities and uh, can be played off against each other very powerfully by people who know how it works. The, the, the great thing about imagery is it looks so simple, and in some ways it is very simple, but if you know how to pull the strings and use the different tricks that are available, one can use that simplicity with very complex results. So I actually had to give that up because I wasn't very good at it. And that as a career move was, I strongly recommend everyone should consider giving up what they think they're best at. Because it was when I stopped being a photographer that I really started learning about photography. And my, my, my life and my career really took off in a, in a very different direction. But it's, it was a, a very difficult moment, but a fantastic moment that in retrospect, when I thought everything was finishing, everything was just starting. So there's, and that I find to be true throughout life, really. Yes, and that's terrifying because the people that you're talking to, you're talking to the audience is bigger than the room that I'm standing in right now with surrounded by undergraduates or postgraduates, your room is well bigger than that. But the people that we're aiming at are these undergraduates or postgraduates that are being pressured into predicting what their, what a rigid career path might look like for them. And as a creative, I understand and know there is no rigid career path. And what you're describing there is nice to hear but you could say in retrospect, but it is terrifying. I would just say that there's a tremendous romance that we're sold about deciding that you want to be a dancer at the age of five and rising to the top of the ballet or whatever career it, it might be. And I think for some people that may be true, but I think there's a tremendous value in keeping an open mind and understanding that what 
looks like a straight trajectory and a, and a straight path to follow may not be appropriate and there may be better ways of getting to where you want to be rather than just following that straight path. The winding path gives a lot more interesting. Being lost is a fantastic place to be, I discover. It's a place of great discovery and learning and that failure along the way is often deceptive, that things that looked like that haven't turned out the way you expected them we often call a failure, but frequently are not. They're the foundations for the next thing that one does. So not to be afraid of that. And of course, that's tied up with all sorts of issues around status and prestige and wanting to be a famous name and all the rest of it. But there are many other ways of living life. And I've found that working in, if you like, behind photographers who are the big names, I've actually had a much big, bigger voice for myself and learned a great deal more about the world and been able to achieve a lot more in the world than I would have done as the named photographer. The trick, of course, being that as a named photographer, one becomes very channeled into what one is known for. The expectation is developed that you will do the same thing again and again, and that's the trap. And I think liberating oneself from that expectation is a fantastic thing. So I started in journalism. I started as a photographer, taught myself the, the ethics and the mechanics of not just holding a camera, but making a sale, selling a story, selling an idea, and then decided I wasn't a very good photographer and started editing, joined this agency, Network Photographers, which is a very politicized agency, which suited me very well. It's what I enjoyed. And then from that, jumped sideways into commercial stock, which I was initially incredibly snobbish about. I uh, thought that journalism is so, is so connected with reality, to use a word, whereas commercial stock is so disconnected from reality. But I learned that from that, there's, it's possible to talk about truth in many different ways. And in some ways, the conceptualized truth of commercial photography, as you see it in advertising and in stock and on you know, all these different places, that very polished, that very finessed imagery also speaks to great truths and develops a tremendous respect for the commercial world. And found also that, that the process of working commercially need not be a matter of selling out at all. And that money while it can be corrupting, can also be a measure of effectiveness. If somebody's going to pay you for a picture, it means that you're communicated somehow. What you need to decide is whether that communication is valid and whether you want to be participating in that process. But money itself is not necessarily corrupting, and that was a big learning for me. And in the, process, in the course of that, I learned I managed to, I suddenly started traveling. That was the big surprise, was having thought that as a photographer, I'd be traveling. I, I didn't, and then as an editor, I did travel. Before you go on to that, Stephen, I just want to just pull you, because there may be people in the room who don't know what stock is. And I've heard you talk about stock before, and you really changed the way that I thought of it as well. So what is a stock photograph? In the most basic form, a stock photograph is a picture which has been made last week, and it sits on the shelf until somebody next week wants to use it for whatever purpose they want to apply it to. So it's actually, it's a very conceptual form of communication. But it's basically talking in code. So you see it used in advertising a great deal. And people come along to the stock library and say, we want to talk about financial security. So that's our client wants to advertise about that. Have you got any pictures which talk about financial security? And our job in stock was to have envisaged what does financial security look like? How does one photograph it? So it's an act of incredible imagination. And in a sense, its detachment from reality is that it is very conceptual. And therefore, one strips out of the picture everything that might connect it with reality, like dirt under the fingernails or a spot on the face or stuff like that all gets stripped out of it. And you end up with this very refined image, which is just an encoded expression of the subject which you want to talk about, which in this instance would be financial security. And it's incredibly cliched. And the value of cliches, it turns out, and of stereotype for that matter, is that it becomes a very powerful medium for communicating rich and complicated ideas very quickly. So you see a couple at a, sitting at a computer on their kitchen table and they're smiling and pointing at a graph on the screen. And they're talking about their finances because there's a checkbook on the, or whatever, not anymore, but some financial instrument, a credit card, maybe a phone in front of them, which indicates financial involvement. And that's why they're talking to the computer. And so it's very stripped down. It's very conceptualized, but it allows one to talk in very allegorical terms and very conceptual terms. And understanding that machinery then becomes a, a tremendous freedom and allows one to talk about things which are very real indeed, even though they have no dirt under their fingernails. This actually can be very much about the real world.
Yeah, you did it again. I'd forgotten what stock was all about. And that's what you said the first time I heard you say to me. You said it's the cleanest and clearest form of communication. It is. And strange things happen. I would say that one of the, one of the, there's an area of conceptual paralysis in the stock world, which is, I think the world is almost entirely middle class. But it's interesting that subjects of, for example, gender, race and disability and other conditions of life other than the white male, that it's actually very aspirational in that the, the stock photograph both reflects the world that people live in, because you want somebody to you know, flick a magazine page or watch a bus drive by in, in the, you know, flat, a split second and understand the image of what it's talking about. So it has to, re has to reflect the world that people are living in, but it also pushes the world that people are living in. The notion of having female business leaders was something which was championed by stock photographers in the 90s, way before there were very many business leaders who were female. On the one hand, it was fantastical and unrealistic. On the other hand, it led an expectation which then slowly becomes reality. It's a very, it's a very profound form of imagery. And just to describe how profound it is, consider that you can buy, you can license a stock photograph for cents, I mean, for almost nothing. And yet Getty Images, which is one of the largest purveyors of stock imagery, makes billions of dollars, billions with a B, from which you have to realize there's a lot of these pictures out there. And as soon as you realize that, it's like water. And the fact that we don't see them very much or don't understand that we see them very much is, speaks to their efficiency and their effectiveness. We understand the messages almost without seeing them. We don't remember the pictures. They're coming on in moments, the time it takes to load a, a screen or whatever it might be. And yet the message has been communicated. And when you think about that volume of imagery, which exists from those cents per purchase into being translated into billions of dollars, these pictures are everywhere. They're highly influential and for good and for ill. For that, it's uh, like any tool, it can be used badly or used. Okay, we're going to come back to stock in a bit. Um, so you started to travel. So I started to travel. I worked for a, a Japanese company, which was fantastic. I strongly recommend it. It has an opportunity to work in Japan, jump at it. It's really an amazing culture. I spent a lot of time in Los Angeles as well. And I have to say, if I compare the two, Los Angeles is by far the stranger place possibly the strangest place in the whole planet, but there's another discussion. So I've traveled around the place and all the time learning and, and trying different things as an editor, as a creative director, as somebody who was responsible for creating imagery one way or another. Hold on. So you start out as a photographer and suddenly you've got this currency and this relevance as a creative director. What's a creative director? So a creative director is someone who defines the look of an image at the simplest terms, a, a specific picture. Or in my instance, I was working for, well, Getty Images at that time for the company. And I describe my job as, as well, it's hard to describe. It's in the context of stock agency, for example, the, you sit at the board table and they go, we need more sales in Germany. And my job is to yell down the speaker tube to the engine room and go more blue, because blue is going to respond to that market or whatever it is. So I'm translating business ideas into creative ideas. How does one visualize the business results that the company wants? So it, it's just a highly creative process. I mean, it sounds very dry and arid, but I have to say my experience in corporate world was phenomenally creative, but not at a superficial level. You look at it. I spent my life sitting in beige offices, staring at computer screens and graphs and charts and talking to financial controllers. But within that, tremendous creativity. And that's what I mean about looking beyond the immediately obvious that at this most literal sense, it was got up, at, got to work at nine o'clock and left at five and very pedestrian in that sense, but explosively creative on the inside, how, how the engine works and understanding it. I think one has to think in those terms to find the creativity anywhere. And there is creativity anywhere. If only we got someone in the room who could talk about AI and prompt engineering as we talk about describing things, maybe we'll come to that in a little bit. So from Getty, what was the next set? So creative, so you've been a photographer, you've been an editor, you've been a creative director. What else have you? I was a CEO for some time. That was a bizarre role, but worked in, for a while after that, I worked in the fashion world, a company called Art and Commerce, which is still around. So um, how would people know Art and Commerce? Who's the most famous? Oh, Stephen Meisel, Annie Leibovitz, so many, Stephen Klein. It was, it was an A-list of fashion and style photographers at that time. This, this was early 2000s. And what were you doing with it? And there I was, it was an interesting task there was, I, my job was to commercialize the archives of these people. 
they were commissioned on a daily basis to shoot for the magazines, for Vogue and for the advertisers, Comme des Garçons, whoever it might be. And then the pictures would just be used for the week and then they would be not used. And my job was to see if there was anything in that archive that could then be commercialized subsequently. I was again thinking very conceptually about an image which had been made to advertise the handbag could in fact be revitalized and used in, in an editorial context for something completely different. And so that was that job. But again, a very, it was a job which was commercially focused, but with tremendous imagination. It was all about thinking, what is the value of these pictures? Who would value it? And it ended up in all sorts of things like in, in conversation with hotel chains about putting pictures on the walls of hotels throughout the world or it was like imagining how these pictures might live in a different environment in a way that was sympathetic and responsive to the ethos of the photographer. And then from that, I moved into the art world, where I was again representing, this was an interesting story, representing the A-list of art photographers like Damien Hirst, Ed Ruscha, Jeff Koons, people like that. But in a very different context, these are people who all produce uniques or small editions of one to three editions, sell them for a million dollars. And the principle behind the company there, iStorm, is no longer around, sadly, was to see if we could democratize art in the same way that the phonogram had democratized music. And if you think about it, before the wax disc, the wax cylinder, the vinyl or whatever medium we use today, the only way to enjoy music was to be in the concert hall, which in previous ages meant having the fur coat and having all the right trappings to afford to go to a concert hall and the socialist expectations to do. The phonogram completely democratized Mozart. Suddenly the music was no, no worse than it had been in a concert hall. Well, obviously audio improved over the years. One can enjoy Mozart without having the fur coat and without having to go to the concert hall. And our principle was with the visual artists was to do the same thing. And the, the medium there was to produce large editions rather than small. So instead of producing, Damien Hirst producing a one spot painting, he'd produce a, a, a print run of a, of a thousand all original, all signed, the lithographs in that instance. So he'd be able to buy an original Damien Hirst with his signature on a numbered edition, where it'd be one of a thousand as opposed to one of three, and therefore available for $500 instead of a, a million dollars. So that was the principle there, was working with all these artists to democratize their work and, and take it out to a, a wider audience. It's, it's, again, what a great idea. And it's, again, it's about imagination. It's about thinking about possibilities, about looking beyond what's immediately presented to one and what's immediately obvious. And I'm trying to make something of it. And it was, I'm very proud of that work. It was phenomenally interesting. This idea of value keeps coming up again and again. Um, and I know that crops up again. When, when was it you went to Seven? So Seven, so I went to Seven after working with, art, with iStorm and the artists. And Seven is a, an agency of essentially at that time conflict photographers who were very much, very preeminent in their, preeminent in their fields. People like Chris Morris, working for Time magazine a lot, and Jim Nachtway and Ron Aviv and others that are phenomenally talented, committed photographers doing extraordinary things. And I did that at precisely the time when the market for photography was disappearing. And so they were doing these extraordinary feats just in human terms of what one has to endure or to the problems one needs to solve to survive in a conflict situation produced pictures as evidence and for history, tremendously committed work, but suddenly no market for it. And how to find the value there, because the value needs to be found if the work is going to continue, because you can't do it without money. One has to provide insurance for oneself. If one has a family, one certainly needs to provide insurance for oneself. You have to buy the equipment, you have to train, all these different things. The term value is really important here. But the value had gone from the market for photography. There's just too many pictures around. This was 2010, around about then. Instagram was just starting and the pictures were, uh, the world was awash in photo photographs. And what I realized there was that the value was not actually in the image. The value is in the talent that the photographers brought to the image. And in that specific context, it was their credibility. In, in a world that was incredibly disbelieving of pictures, it was the real value of, of Seven was that people would believe these photographers that the imagery, of course, could be subject to any kind of manipulation, but one knew if it came from this source, it was honest, direct, and truthful to this situation. And that turned out to be a good step to move in, because then it allowed us to work not just as photographers, which it, it, in a very crass way, you think of as just a, a craft practice. It's obviously not, it's a lot more involved with it. Than, 
but it, it allowed us to, to work in a more, in a deeper level with our clients. So we became if you like visual collaborators, working with that in time, with people like doctors, like Borders and Red Cross and other such people whose own message absolutely relied on integrity and truthfulness. And so we were able to collaborate with them, not just as in creating the pictures, but in creating visual strategies about how does one con convey these subjects with meaning and with substance, which people would believe. Um, so that notion of creating value through credibility and integrity was really key to that. And e so even as the world flooded with pictures, we were still able to find value for those photographers for who they were as much as for what they produced. That's, no, that's amazing. I do remember that moment when you, you said it being quoted, reading it somewhere, it's all value because it their photographs, it's their credibility. That's right. And imagery as it's expl exploded in its use, I think becomes increasingly interesting. Still hear people talking about there being too many pictures in the world and how can we make sense of it all? And I, th I think it's absolutely rubbish. I think it's directly equivalent with words, for example. Words can be told that tell truth, they can be spoken that tell lies. But we know the difference. We know where to find poetry, we know where to find an instruction manual. They're all words. And the same is true of pictures, that pictures are all over the place. They have an, an apparent simplicity about them, just like any word. But we are slowly teaching ourselves as a culture to understand their meaning in a much more profound way. And I think the more that pictures are used, the more we understand them. And what's more interesting than that even, I think that what happens with social media in particular is it moves the, the still photograph from being a statement, here's this moment in time frozen and here for your inspection, into a conversation where the picture comes, it goes, it washes into the stream of information that we all absorb on social media. To the extent that tomorrow we may not remember the picture that we saw yesterday, but we will have understood the meaning and that will have increased our understanding of the world in some way. And we will be responding to that. So you get these dialogues opening up on social media of people responding to each other visually. And in a world where the picture itself becomes very disposable, but the knowledge it contains becomes much richer. So it's a fascinating world. We don't know where it's going. It's very open to abuse. And we're going to, I think, we're going to experience a few years of extreme difficulty as synthetic imagery comes more and more prevalent and the, the belief in the image as a factual truth, source of truth weakens, I think out of the other side of that comes a much richer environment, which is where the picture that we look at is no longer understood as a representation of something that actually physically happened in front of a lens, but becomes a representation of an idea. And that I think takes us into a much, much richer field, both as communicators, as a culture, in every which way, where we have to let go of some of those treasured attributes that were you know, used to exist in photography as it was in the 19th and 20th century. And in losing that, it feels like any growth, it feels like a loss at first, just as one grows up through life, you feel that you're losing something as you move from one phase to the next, but we also reach for something new and bigger. And we carry that experience with us, even if the actual physical attributes that the photograph may have changed, we're carrying forwards our understanding of imagery into a completely new environment and can learn bigger, better ways of viewing the world. Yeah, so we're doing some really interesting stuff at NTU at the minute where we've just written a course where one of the classes in there is called uh, Sensor Informed Storytelling. And uh, we're using smart fabrics and accelerometers inside people, smart fabrics on the outside them. And we're using AI and 3D mapping in order to sense when they're about to fall over, to predict what's going to happen inside their body and then actually show people what will happen. And you know, effectively, it will be the first time we've photographed the future. Now, I mentioned it, I actually road tested this idea with Alex C. Nuria, to speak to you, Stephen, and he said to me, and here's a guy who is a, an established and successful photojournalist who relies on images being used and believed, said, thank goodness, finally, photography will be, will be able to unshackle itself from the truth. And that took my breath away that a photojournalist would say that. I think that's right. I, I, although I would suggest he probably didn't say unshackle ourselves from the truth, but maybe un, unshackle ourselves from... The factual, from what we can see from the facts in front of the camera, are very limiting. No, Alexei's fantastic. Alexei came to my attention first when he was creating his grandfather's visual diary of his experiences in the Second World War, which of course didn't exist. And he was doing it entirely through synthetic processes using AI and computers and such. But creating this truth, which previously had not been visualized, it was very powerful. And so, absolutely committed. Alexei's committed to truth in a very big way and to honesty and integrity and representation, but 
not necessarily just by recording facts in front of a lens. Ian Campbell, oh, please introduce yourself. What is it you do? Where, where, where are you from? So I am from the Yorkshire Dales originally. I grew up on a, a small holding on a hill in the middle of nowhere. And I work here at Nottingham Trent University, so I teach on the product design degrees. Outside of here, I also I, I run a business with my wife called Campbell Coal. We make bags. We design bags, leather goods, things like that, which we have manufactured in the UK and sell through our website to people all over the world. And then over the last two years, coming up to two years, I've been fairly deep down a rabbit hole of exploring generative AI and really focused on like how do we derive meaningful output beyond just creating images for the sake of it. That's, I'm quite focused on how we can use it as a tool in design process as well. So think about how we use it as a tool for ideation and things like that. Yeah, I would put a bit of, throw a bit of context around our meeting or how I came across your work, because it wasn't very long ago. I'd just written a couple of courses, for these courses for NTU. I knew we had to address issues surrounding AI and I was excited about the prospect. And it, but at this time, unbeknownst to me, the thing that I was getting most excited about was this guy on Instagram who's making these incredible photographs that I thought fa just found fantastic. And eventually I clocked that they were in fact AI. Now this really got me excited because then I find this person leaves their prompts there. So anybody not sure what prompts are yet. So prompt, you prompt an, an AI to create an image and how you prompt it will dictate necessarily what you produce. And so the fact that you, did to you, because it was you, eventually I tracked you down and it's in a bizarre set of circumstances. It turned out that we were both working in the same institution. Not only do you, were you doing this, but you were doing it as a product designer and it was informing your product design. And suddenly it became about advanced ideation, not AI, which that got me really excited. But how would you break down your process? We've talked a lot here about value today and we try and, and one of the things that Steve was talking about was how he thought about images and how he described images when he was talking about describing them, shouting down the, the pipe down, a bit more blue or whatever it was, thinking about how to speak clean, clearly with stock images. I see that in your prompts, your prompt engineering. Could you break that down for us how you do it? I think it depends on the situation. Sometimes my approach can be purely explorative and it's, it's not really for anyone else. It might just be, I'm just starting with an idea or I might have seen something I'm like maybe it's just a I'm just inspired by something or a collection of things and I just start out with a few words and then I build on them and then I might start to lean into a few concepts which I tend to rely on like audio device for example because I'm quite interested how like how say uh, murmuration porcelain and audio device where do those things come together do, do we end up with an abstract representation of sound or does the device itself take on a certain form? Bit right, inform break that down. It's what I've heard that you were looking, you, some of the concepts you come back to a sound device. So I'm thinking you're thinking of a speaker, you're thinking of a radio or something. And that's the thing you'll try to visualize with your AI. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. It, and there's, there's certain things I lean into just because we have an understanding of what that thing should look like. And then I'm interested to try and understand how AI might or, or what might emerge from the latent space, as it were, like how it could be interpreted in a different way. And quite, I think one of the real powers for, with AI is that you can reach places that might be otherwise very difficult to imagine. Trying to put together those three things might be a very difficult thing to do and an even harder thing to articulate or to visualize or to draw or to sketch. But it's still me that's driving that process and putting those things in. So I think that's one way, that's the sort of bit that I spend quite a lot of time on just because it's, oh, what about this? What about that? What about the other? Or sometimes that purely explorative thing might start with, I'm out for a walk with my daughter and I'm just taking photographs on my phone. And then I might use that as a start point. I might have a photograph of the way, like bark on a tree, close up photograph of bark on a tree. And then I might, I'll either unpick that and think about what I'm seeing in that visually, like an orderly, disorderly, there might be something in there, or there might be something in the image itself, which I, I use as an image reference. And then I build on top of that. And then I might slowly gravitate back towards some of the seating device or whatever it is. So that's one way. Then the other way is much more in line with a sort of product design process, I, I think, where you we might start with a brief and then the next step is broadening your contextual awareness around the what it is that you're trying to solve for so whether that's looking at trends whether it's understanding people or whether it's doing research into materials and then that sort of come comes together into what would be a design brief but 
I think when you're working with AI, it starts to become like a series of prompts. And so there's a that really, for, I think for me, a lot of that process is around asking really good questions. And it's trying to frame everything you understand in very short, articulated uh, sentences, which are your prompts that might have influence from your research, whether it's materials influence or whether it's something to do with the behavior that you're trying to facilitate. And it's quite abstract to understand what I'm saying is quite, it's quite a, quite an abstract concept perhaps, but, and I think in that case, you can be quite meaningful in what you're trying to get out the other end. And the more kind of parameters you put in place, the more things you address, are you thinking about the human environment? Are you thinking about the world that this thing, product service system lives in? Are you thinking, is there a contextual narrative that you're building around this? This is about thinking back to one of the first things I did with AI was, was an alarm clock project. And I remember having a conversation with one of my colleagues and I, he helped me to reframe my thinking on this a little bit in terms of I was thinking about the object and then he was like, what about the, the thing that it does? And then I got into this train of thought that was all around metamorphosis. And I was like, it's about maybe an alarm clock is about changing state. Maybe it's moving from being asleep to being awake. So then metamorphosis. And then I got into this, I was like, what else changes states in that way? And then I went down this whole expanding foam explosion route. I went down this whole, it was, it, but each time like I was prompting something then something would come out of it and then I'd build on that. And it eventually I ended up with this. It very loosely is a conceptual idea, this alarm clock, which had this expanding flame explosion that came out of the top of it. It might be that, or it might be that visual visualization and explosion could be a scent, or it could be audio, or it could be something else. It doesn't actually have to be expanding foam, but it might be the thing you're looking at. You can then interpret and go, what if it woke you up with smell? And then you've got some, something else entirely. So I use AI as, I try, I tend to think of AI as being a collaborative partner, like someone else whose values, whose ideas I value and respect can say things to me that I might not have thought of. Equally, sometimes it, I don't get much from it, but then I'm probably just not asking the right questions. And then I think the other thing that can be really valuable is that just it's, if I wake up at two o'clock in the morning and I can't sleep and I just want to have a bit of an explore, like there's no, <laughs> it's not tired. I don't know, it, he, she, whatever, but the AI system is not tired. It's always there, always fresh. And I think, I realize I'm talking a bit here, but the other thing that I think is really interesting from a product design process is the speed with which you can do things potentially takes you away from the trap of becoming really embedded in an idea that you can't then back out of. So I think it has this potential to reduce outcome bias as well. Traditionally, you might sketch something, you might then do some renders, you might create a 3D model. Then you might put it in front of people and then you might go, this is the wrong idea. But at that point, like you are hours and hours into an idea, whereas you can do things much quicker with AI, which means that you can explore a range of things and then very quickly back out of things if they're not working or tear it up altogether and start again. Yeah. Whistle stop tour of my process. Yeah. But it's I'm listening to it through the ears of a, a, well, someone who was a photographer. I now teach it rather than practices. There's someone who's trying to understand what photography might be. I think this is really fascinating because you're working with images just as you I mean, the, the elephant in this room at this point, it is obviously this conversation about stock. How is that making you feel, Steve? I'm tremendously excited. I, I find it very hard to visualize everything that you're describing and that's what makes it so exciting. And it, it's, again, it's about breaking through the barriers of imagination. It's, it's not relinquishing control, it's actually allowing oneself to be carried and also allowing one's own force to come in to, to push it further. It's thrilling. So that's, what I'm hearing is it sounds like just on a recent job. Can we, we talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. So we, when you talked about shouting down the pipe for the art director, creative directing, as far as I'm hearing you're doing, with what, describe the, the job that you've done recently. So I was recently asked if I would help a company who basically produced CGI backdrops and visuals for product designers to drop their products into. And they wanted to create essentially some stock imagery that they could use in their Instagram ads, social media ads. And the, the brief was creatives sat at desks in creative studio environments, really open brief, but we we're like very quickly able to create a, a, a large number of images. Uh, which then we could then go through a process of saying this is working while well, this isn't working. We could ensure from the start that there was th 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 there was like diversity in the images in terms of the way that people looked, the environments they were uh, working in, 
Uh, that we, I think we reduced that down to around 10 images. And at the minute, we're going through a process of running those ads, working out what's, what's working, uh, what's not working, A, B, testing them in a way, and then we can do more of what works and what doesn't work. And we can do that. We can, we can do that very quickly. And I, I think, yeah, this, the speed thing's interesting, but also th this is a small company who wouldn't have been able to commission 10 locations, 10 models, and all the teams that surrounded those people as well. So it's giving them access. It's the leveling, leveling that allowing them to level up and do something which they potentially wouldn't be able to do otherwise, uh, which is really powerful. Yeah. What I find is interesting here, and I'm, I think it, I'm, I'm going to crush my own arguments here. I think when I saw your work as a product designer, I know, knew that I had, didn't have the knowledge of materials that you have. And I, and therefore I thought I couldn't prompt those designs. I couldn't do that. And, but then I took solace in the fact that with 25, 30 years of being a photographer, I have that collateral knowledge to draw on of image making, of processes, of photographic materials for sure. And so the stuff that I can draw on that perhaps you can't, but if you are now going away and doing those stock jobs, then that really, you didn't need my 30 years of knowledge in order to describe something that the AI could, would have been my job previously. I mean, that literally, that would have, I, I, I've shot stock. Think what you'd have in your years of taking photographs is an eye for the image though and the composition and the a, re, a very refined aesthetic or taste or looking at something going that arm needs to be a little bit closer to here where i might be um just I, I don't think less critical but less perceptive too and i think because i think so much working with ai is about your aesthetic sensibility it's about your taste and about looking at something and knowing whether something looks good or not. I think on the other side of it, like one of the things I did last summer was, so AI systems respond very well to film stocks, for example, and some of those kind of, a lot of the technical photography terms, which I wasn't that clued into. So I did spend a lot of time last summer, like researching different film stocks and then testing them all through AI systems to understand what the impact was that those different things would have to then know what I could lean into here and there. The, and the thing that's actually interesting I found recently is I use a little Rico when I'm out and about, like just a little point and shoot camera. And I've started to play with things more since I've been working with AI. So I've started doing quite a lot recently with long shutter speeds, which I'd never have done before. But I'm, because of some of the images I'm creating with AI, I'm now like, why aren't I just, why aren't I doing that with my camera myself? So there's, I'm definitely, I think I'm being more creative with the camera now as well. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Which is great. I think that's what I want our photographers to do. I want us to use it as an ideation tool. Yeah. You suggested to us that we take eight images of a story, eight portraits or eight or whatever it is, and ask the AI to give you the last two, or give it versions of the last two. Yeah. Which to me, it seems tremendously exciting, especially if you're thinking of something like fashion photography shoot or something like that to ideate on. But what I'm we're taking away, which is more important right now, is the fact that what I, when I said, I think my argument is being crushed because you can do my job. What you told me then was, in fact, uh, you said earlier on, if you, if the AI isn't working, then you're asking the wrong questions. Maybe my job is capture. If, if my only job is capture, then maybe that job is under threat. But Stephen made a job, made a career doing what you're describing of creative directing. So maybe I do have a value in that space. It reminds me of, you know, recording that. It's Richard Sperry, I think, who describes this apocryphal village with two gas lighters. So people used to light the lamps on the street, gas lamps. There are two gaslighters working in this village, and one of them thinks of himself as a gaslighter, whereas the other one thinks of himself as working in the lighting industry. And so when electricity is invented, only one of them has a job. And what he says there is, he said, I think he said, if memory serves, said, fix your fortunes to the mode of delivery and you'll be stuffed. Hitch your fortunes to the mode of information and you'll thrive. So I think that's my, top, my sort of takeaway at this point is, be a Stephen. Be a Stephen. Hitch your fortunes to the mode of information. I, I think that's right. It is about, it's a tremendous imaginative act. And of course, our imaginations are limited by what we've seen before. And always pushing oneself to try and transgress that to, it's a constant A-B testing with one's own life in a way. It's just, did this work? What can work better? Checking it out, trying it. And just, I would just come back to this notion of failure to say that there's, there's no point that you cross, that you, that you move from being a failure to being a success. We are all being successful and we're all being failures at the same time, just in different applications. And I, th I think it's also very important to, to recognize one's own place in this role and not to look to others to define one's place. 
that it's absolutely possible to make your own rules and your own measures of success, and which can have considerably greater impact than the than if you like the big brand performances that we see in culture. I don't. I think I, I want to draw it to a close at this point. I think. But is there anything we've not talked about? Even what we should talk about? I definitely think there's more to talk about, but I won't know what it is until five minutes after we've stopped talking. I've got a load of takeaways from this. And one of the most important ones for me is to understand what my own product is. I, I started out as a photographer and I've really found that I have more value as a creative thinker. And sometimes that's led me to be presented with wicked problems. And I've loved pitching into the, the team of people that solve those problems. And that's how I think of teaching and photography where it is right now, because it's quite a challenge to think about photography. If you think about it in the, in the traditional sense then it's fairly terminal. If you just think of yourself as being an image capture, that's, if that's your only product, then a camera operator role is, is there's few and far between. Whereas I think as, as, as creative thinkers, we have huge value as being visually literate. We, are, we, we have an internet that's visually led. If you can, visually led, if you can speak clearly and move people direction with images, then surely there are jobs for us everywhere. That's going to be my takeaway from today anyway. Forrest, what's your takeaway? Um, I, I think similar. I, I think we really, uh, what an opportunity to have this conversation. Really enjoyed it. And I think just to, I think the point on understanding where your role is in it, it uh, there's a brilliant quote, which I'm not going to try and quote, but a conversation recently where Rick Rubin was being asked whether he can play instruments, whether he can do this. And his answer was no, can't do that, can't do that. But he has that taste. He can pull these things together. And I, I take a lot from that. I'm a big admirer of his, him and his work anyway, but... Yeah, that you can, there's a role for us as these kind of orchestrators of these situations, which I'd, I'd and I, I think this leans into what you've been talking about, Stephen, as well, with your kind of role as editor and things like that as well. I think my takeaway is I was just blown away watching your prompting process earlier and realizing it's not linear. And I always thought of it as a having starting with an objective and ending up with a, an outcome. And then watching how you worked that in the meantime, it was multiple layers all at once in different ways. And Seeing what that leads to is really extraordinary. Um, it's not linear. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's a great plug for your AI prompt engineering workshops. Ian, I know people are going to want to get in touch with you. How should they do it? Two two ways, probably. LinkedIn, Ian Campbell Cole. If you search that, you'll find me there. I'm also showing bits of work, not so much recently, but I'm showing work on Instagram as well. My Instagram is at IanCC underscore uh, WIP, which is work in progress. And it is a work in progress. It's like a... They have a learning in public as well. I wonder what the Whitbread stood for. Yeah, I will, I'll leave links afterwards. And Stephen, how can people get in touch? LinkedIn, Stephen Mays, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, M-A-Y-E-S. And then you both promised to come back and do a live Q&A when the term starts again. So I'm really looking forward to that. And perhaps we can pick this conversation up again. Look forward to it. Brilliant. Thank you very much.